Creating a personal website has been one of the best decisions I've made in my career as a front-end developer. It allowed me to have a space to share valuable content outside of any platform. It took me months, if not years, to build it, and I think I finally found the perfect combination of libraries. So today I want to share all of that with you, and of course, there's a link to the code in the description. So this is my website and when you load it, you're going to see that there's this highlight effect. I'm going to do it again. And then there's a bit of copy, my profile picture, the latest YouTube video and a CTA. This is for getting you code reviews from my code review series on YouTube. And then there are my latest blog articles. So when you go to a blog article, you're going to see that there are not only inline code, which is beautifully styled, but there is also live code examples. This is from my latest video about hooks. There's also a services page. And this is your typical landing page about the services that I offer as an IT consultant. And there's here a CTA. And when you click on quick video call, then you're gonna land here. And this is a Google Calendar invite thingy where people can just make an appointment with me directly. You have these footer elements with all the tags that are in the blog posts. There's also a newsletter that people can join. And here you can see the previous issues of the newsletter. Then I have a lead magnet page here for the front end kit. And lead magnet, it just means that you provide something for free in exchange for people's emails. And this is my resource collection. So when you go to get it, you can also just have direct access if people don't wanna give you their email. Or you can click on join the newsletter and then you can enter your email and receive it by mail. There's also an about page. So this is just my CV where I've worked and some projects. And again, this front end newsletter. Of course, the website also supports dark mode and by default it's on auto. So if I change to dark mode, it's gonna be in dark. Before checking out the code, I also wanted to mention that this website is also SEO friendly. So every time that there is a change, Google is notified and the website gets crawled again. And there's also a dynamic sitemap at XML, and this is what Google uses for crawling the website. Now let's go into the code. I wanted to start with the framework, and here I'm using Next.js with the app router. So here you can find all the pages. Every folder is a page. So you're probably already wondering which uh, UI library I'm using, and for that I'm using Muntine. Montaigne is my favorite UI library. It's super modern. It looks very cool. And the cool thing is that it's very developer friendly and you can customize the theme very easily. Now, when it comes to the blog entries, I have a content folder that includes the previous newsletter issues and also a posts folder. And here you can find all my previous posts. And when you open one of them, you're going to see we have title, description, date, image, a slug. This is what's used inside the URL and then the tags and whether it's draft or not. And then you have your markdown. But the thing is, this is not normal markdown, it's MDX. So you can have React components in between. So if I open this awesome React hooks, you're gonna see that I have React components like examples that awesome hooks that hover. And for that, I use a library called content layer. If I go to package.json. This is next content layer two. There's a two at the end because this is a fork from the original next content layer, which is not maintained anymore, but this one seems like it's maintained. Maybe we do need a new library. And how this works is that I have a configuration file here. This is this content layer.config. And here I define all the types that I'm using. So there are two markdown document types. I have newsletter, which has the fields title, date, and slug. And this is what you see here in the top. And then we have a post component, which has other fields. And there's also this computed fields that I'm using to dynamically extract the headings from the content and put them in the table of contents. And this configuration file is used by the library to generate the types and the documents. And let's just jump to where the documents are shown. So this is the blog post page. So you have post slash slug, and this is a parameter that we can use to figure out which blog post this is. And I have here a function get all blog posts sorted by create date. And this uses this all posts variable, which is, as you can see, 
imported from content layer slash generated. And here I'm also importing the type. So this is all dynamically generated from the configuration file that I showed you before. And then I have this post component where I render the post. So here I'm just grabbing the image and the title and showing an image in the beginning. Then there is a sidebar. But the most relevant thing here is this render post. And let's scroll a little bit. And here I have this render MDX. And so this is the part where I'm defining how the MDX code should be transformed to React. So here I have the components list that's going to be used internally. So for example, for anchors, I want to use my own component, which is A in big. And then I have H1. And for H1, I'm going to use my own H1 component. And I also have an href anchor wrapper thingy that just adds in href so that you can click on the titles and you can add any component you want and then use it inside your markdown. So here I also have these examples and this is an object. Let's just go to it and you can see it's just a list from examples. This is used in multiple blog posts and I just grouped them in one object. That way it's easier to find. So every time I just add a new component here and then I can use it inside the markdown. So next we have this uh, code block and for this I also have a custom component and it's called code block if I'm not mistaken. So there's two components called block server and client. This is very Next.js specific but what I'm using under the hood is just Shiki.js for the code syntax highlighting. Now Shiki.js has beautiful themes. Let's go to the website and here you can select any language and you can check out the themes that they have. So you can just choose the theme that you want and then add it to the code. And then when it comes to these live examples where you have some kind of React component here and then the code. And for that, I have a specific component. So if I go to examples, and let's just go to a counter example. So I have this example template that receives a code, just a string, and then you pass in the component and it's gonna be layouted in that way. And if you don't want to write the code yourself, there's also the possibility to just read it from a file. So here I have this use local storage example. And instead of passing the code, I just pass the file. And if I go inside the component, you're going to see that I'm checking if there's a code. Otherwise, I read that file and that's going to be the content of it is going to be the code. And by default, it's TypeScript. But if you're using another language, you can change it here. So for the newsletter, I'm using Lemon Squeezy, and there are many reasons why I chose Lemon Squeezy. It's free to subscribe with. It had the functionality that I needed, which is a newsletter and lead magnets. I like also the documentation. They have really good developer documentation. And somehow I was also surprised to find out that a lot of the big players didn't have some kind of API reference. So I always had to take an iframe and put it in my website, and that's not what I wanted to do. And for adding Lemon Squeezy on my website, if you go to a newsletter form, I just have a form, so use form. This comes from Muntime slash form. And it's very similar to React hook form if you used that before. So I have my form definition here. It's styled and everything. The components come from the library. And on submit, I have a special function. And this is a really <laughs> funny thing that I've added here. So I used to have a lot of bot subscribers and I couldn't figure out how to prevent it for a while until I added this uh, trick here. It's a hidden checkbox that says I agree to the privacy policy and normally a human would not click on it because it's invisible and inside this use form I have a validate and here there's an error that when the terms of service are checked it means that you're a bot so the form will not be submitted. And that really fixed the problem for me. Other than that, I'm just making a fetch request to the URL and the users are added to the newsletter. And for the lead magnet, I am just using a product. So I have two lead magnets, Gichichi, and then there's the front end kit. This is just a product and pricing. I selected lead magnet and in the confirmation uh, model, I have put the link to the Notion website and I've also put it inside the email receipt. And when you click on share, you receive this uh, UUID that you can use inside the website. This is all also very well documented inside their uh, API documentation. And I just have this special URL 
and I'm passing in the product ID. So when the user clicks on join newsletter and download for free, this pop-up appears. Now let's move into the fun part, which is SEO. So if I go back to my blog and take a random blog post, let's copy the URL and go to Open Graph. This is a really cool online tool that you can use to see how your website looks like when you share it on social media. You can see when I share it on Facebook or X, LinkedIn, etc. Then you can see that there's the title, the description and the photo. And the way this is achieved, if I go to the page component, there should be a generate metadata function. And here I am defining the image source and the title, the description, the tags. And for that, I have a special uh, custom function that adds my URL in the beginning of it and just formats it in an SEO friendly way. And Next.js takes this output and puts it inside the document. Another important thing to have in your website is a sitemap. And this is just an XML file that includes all of your pages. And for that, there is just a sitemap.ts and inside of it, I am defining all of these entries. So I have these blog posts and then the tags and then the newsletter entries. And then I have here static paths, which are all the paths that I want Google to know about. And I also have two paths, which is images and landings that I currently don't want Google to know about. And every time that I make changes to my website, then Google gets notified by that. So when I go to the GitHub repository and go to actions, you're going to see that after each commit, there is a pipeline that is run. And the most important command is this one run command. And these are all the pages that get notified to Google. So to set this up, you can just follow the instructions from the GitHub repository. I'm going to put the link for that in the description. Now, another tool that I use for my website for SEO is Ahrefs. So this is an SEO tool that has a free tier, which is what I'm using and regularly crawls your website and looks for errors and stuff that you may improve. And it's also super helpful to find out which keywords people are searching for on Google that they land on your website. And you can also see um, your competitors, I think. Here are the competitors and stuff like that. Go check it out. It has a free tier and it's really cool. And by the way, they also have a Chrome extension that I'm also using. Also analyzes your website when you're developing it and you can see uh, the errors while developing it. So that's also really useful. So for deployment, I'm using Vercel. I'm choosing Vercel because it's easy to set up. And I also have a custom uh, NPM script, which is built uh, Vercel. And the reason for that is that when you're building your website, you should run content layer two and then next build. And that was just a small error that I had. So I added the script and set it up there and it works very good. Other than that, it was really easy to set up. Thanks for watching my video. I hope it was valuable to you. If you have any feedback or suggestions, make sure to tell me in the comments or open a pull request on GitHub. Other than that, see you in the next video.